All right, everybody. Um, my name is Gary. I'm going to deliver the lecture on phylogenetics and phylogenomics uh, for you. Um, this is a uh, well, a version of a lecture that I've been giving for for about eight years. Uh, first time I tried it was about three hours long, and um, everybody keeps telling me to scale it back. I'm trying to get it into about 60 minutes. I've had to cut a lot of stuff out. Um, even still, there's a lot of information in here. There's more information in the lecture notes than I'm going to be um, actually talking about. I mean, I'll talk about every slide, but in some slides you'll see there's kind of like a lot of text. Um, so that's there for you um, as additional uh, resource for, for understanding phylogenetics um, and phylogenomics. Okay, um, so uh, before I get started, uh, I can just get a show of hands. Who here has built a phylogenetic tree before? Yeah, okay, so about half. Um, who has in, is comfortable interpreting a phylogenetic tree? Okay, smaller number of people. All right, can anybody tell me the difference between a, like a neighbor joining tree and a maximum likelihood tree? You don't have to actually say, just put up your hands if you know. One person. Okay, then I think I've got this about right. Okay, by the end of this lab or this lecture, you will know the difference. Okay, so so let's get started. The objectives for this module are to really to understand the the basics of the of, of phylogenetic trees. What are the the different uh, the terminology and the different parts? A little bit about how to interpret phylogenetic trees and um, some sections on building phylogenetic trees, and then also the extension um, out to phylogenomic trees. Okay, so, so mean evolution simply described is descent with modification. Essentially, we can, what we, you know, we observe that um, our, uh, the offspring of our ancestors have similar traits, but sometimes those traits change over time, and the accumulation of those traits can result in, um, well, uh, speciation and a differentiation. And um, those traits basically, uh, so there's lots of, there's some changes and there's some things that are the same between a group of related organisms. Phylogenetics is the, uh, well, it is a scientific method and a computational method that studies the evolutionary relationship between, um, well, biological entities. So these could be species or genes, they could be um, parts of limbs or really anything that you're, you're interested in, something that essentially is um, related through evolution, so essentially biological species. And these days mostly what we're using is DNA, because DNA is, and, and genes uh, more specifically, are the unit of heredity. Uh, and uh, they do a good job of allowing us to determine the evolutionary relationship of a group of, of organisms. But, um, you know, before DNA um, and still in, within the field of what's called cladistics, there are different ways of, of inferring the uh, evolutionary relationship between a group of organisms. For, for, for example, morphologies like bone structure, flower structure, language actually can be used to, uh, to infer evolutionary relationships. There's lots of, of different ways to go around it. We're going to focus obviously on using um, genetic data and genomic data. And so the, um, the, using that data, what we can do is we can build these um, inferred evolutionary relationships, which we, which we refer to as phylogenetic trees. So, in most circumstances, when we're going to build a phylogenetic tree, the data that we have available to us is for the existing, um, uh, well, we call them taxa, those organisms, those, those, those units, so those biological units. Uh, we normally don't have access to the ancestral data. Sometimes we do, so if we can if we have access to the fossil record, then we actually do have the ancestral data that we can use to make comparisons with. But normally that's not the case, especially when we're working in the field of microbial informatics with, under, with very rare exceptions, we are only using the extant um, data that's available to us. Isolates that essentially have, we have been able to uh, 
you know, we've been able to extract the DNA from that, uh, that are recently living. So the, um, what we need to do is to um, infer what the relationships are from the, from the existing data and the, uh, the ancestors that, uh, that gave rise to, those, to, those, to their um, progeny. And so that makes, uh, in order to do that, we have to make some assumptions about the, um, the process that of, of evolution that gave rise um, from the ancestors to their, um, to, their, uh, to their progeny, okay? So what we're saying kind of here is that we have access for the organisms that are on the very ends of the tree, the tips of the tree, and everything internal are inferred. Okay, so so here we're um, going to talk a little bit about some of the the tree terminology. So so the tree writ large, the phylogenetic tree, is basically that structure that models the evolutionary history of that group of sequences or organisms or whatever the taxa are. And the tree itself is consists of nodes, the little dots here, right, and branches which connect those nodes together and um, provide us with that relationship. So these, these terminal nodes, the ones that we have data for, those are called the terminal nodes or the leaves, um, or sometimes they're called the tips. Um, more generally they're called the operational taxonomic units. Um, people who are familiar in, with metagenomic analysis may also have heard of operational taxonomic units and they are kind of conceptually um, define a kind of a, a different, uh, well, sort of a, a different set of data, but ultimately they're actually describing the same things. I'm not going to get into it. I just want to make sure that people aren't being confused about, for people who actually do have some metagenomic background, that the, the OTUs, which are basically these similar sequences that are clustered together, um, are not the same thing as the OTUs in um, phylogenetic trees. The OTUs are the single nodes that exist on the tip of the tree. Okay, so the uh, the internal nodes are the inferred hypothetical ancestors of the um, well of their of their descendants, and um, the ancestor of all of the um, the taxa, all of the OTUs, so all of the progeny and their ancestors is called the root. Okay, and that's here. So we have our terminals, we have our internal nodes, we have our branches that connect them, and then we have the, the, the ultimate ancestor, which is called the root. But not every phylogenetic tree actually has a, has a root, does not, has a known root. Any questions about tree terminology so far? Okay, so a little bit more here. So we can group um, subsets of the tree into these logical subclusters called clades or, monophylet or monophyletic groups. And so those are the, well, the, a group of species which is, um, or OTUs, which is arbitrary, um, but um, uh, normally is used to define something that is important, like an outbreak clade versus non-outbreak clade, something like that. The clade itself, um, contains the, uh, well, the ancestor and all of its descendants. So it always includes the terminal nodes, not just the internals. So it's always the terminal nodes and some internal. You can, <clears throat> so, uh, and there's, there's sister taxa, which are the, um, the species or the groups of species that arise from the from the same node. Uh, so we have here uh, A and B. These are sister taxa, and they're um, they but they contain this um, internal ancestor here. C and D are sister taxa, and the clades themselves, A B clade here and C D clade here, clade one and clade two, these are also referred to as sister taxa because they also um, are connected by the same common ancestor. All right. <clears throat> so one of the things that we assume um, when we're building a tree is that the ancestor gives rise to um, 
two descendants the, under a process of speciation. And um, so that means that at every node will have three branches, one to its ancestor, to its own ancestor, and then two descendants. Okay, normally. That's called a bifurcating tree or a dichotomous tree. So that's normally what we see. Here's a fully resolved tree where you can see every node has three connections. Well, with the exception of this root node here. Okay, <clears throat> so that's fully resolved. But not um, all trees have enough information to provide that bifurcating structure so that they're fully resolved. Those trees um, sometimes can have more than two descendants from an ancestor. So if you have three or more descendants from, an, from one ancestor, they're called a polytomy. And polytomies um, are of two types. There's hard polytomies and soft polytomies. Hard polytomies are when you know that um, there have been, um, instead of um, a speciation, like this one speciation event from a common ancestor, there, there have been two, so that you have, say, well, or more than, than, than one speciation event. So that there are, say, there are three or more descendants that are directly related to a common ancestor rather than just one. Um, can anybody give me an example of how something like that might occur? <coughs> well, one possible occurrence is that the, um, the ancestral or the descendants of the ancestral organism get separated from each other at around the same time into separate geographical locations. So think like, after the um, last ice age, when the ice started to melt and the water started to rise, you could there could be um, occasions where you may have like um, say an island, a large island that gets flooded and starts to essentially create pools and multiple islands as the water rises up. Right. So if instead of having one island, now you may have like, with say with three peaks on it, you have three separate islands, and those organisms essentially are going to start to um, diverge from each other, but they all diverge from a common ancestor. This is actually the case um, um, in, in for, for several um, organisms. There's a type of fruit fly in the Seychelles Islands, actually, which is known to form a hard polytomy where there's different, um, uh, th more than two speciation events from one ancestor. Okay, the other more common one is called a soft polytomy, and this is where you have three descent or well three or more descendants from a common ancestor that likely under, underwent a regular speciation event but you don't have enough phylogenetic information to actually be able to tease out what that um, pattern of, um, of of speciation was so that just means that there's just not enough information and so you can group those together into what's called a, a soft polytomy okay and at the, so the, and those are called partially resolved trees. You can also get a fully unresolved tree called a star tree. Um, those are kind of a special case that I will talk about a little bit later when we discuss neighbor joining trees. All right, so there's, there's two main ways to depict a phylogenetic tree, cladograms and um, uh, phylograms. So the cladogram is the simplest type of tree it only shows the relative recency of the common ancestry. So in this example here, we have three OTUs um, here represented out at the leaves. And this cladogram shows us that A and B are related by a common ancestor, and the common ancestor of A and B are related with a, um, to C by a common ancestor. That's the relationship of their ancestry. <clears throat> It doesn't tell us anything about the, the degree of divergence that has occurred amongst those three um, OTUs throughout that evolutionary event. Okay, that means that the branches in those trees ha uh, the, have they may have different lengths, but the lengths have no meaning. It's only the t what's called the topology of the tree, right? The way that the tree is organized in a cladogram that gives us any phylogenetic information. Are there questions about cladograms? Okay, so the phylogram is uh, it contains more information than just a simple cladogram. It's the one that actually does contain information about the rate of evolution of the the relative rates of evolution of the different OTUs in that phylogenetic tree. So it contains that relative recency information, 
in the same way that a cladogram does, and so this is, has the same topology that I showed in the last example, but we can see that the branch lengths are different here, and so in, normally in a, in a phylogram you can place these numbers that give us a sense, uh, well, it quantizes the, um, the, the amount of the divergence or amount of difference between um, the different species. Normally when, a spe um, when an ancestor gives rise to its progeny, they will evolve at a linear rate only for a short time. Then they will acquire different evolutionary rates, and so one may acquire mutations slowly, another one acquires mutations much more quick quickly, and so that means that their, their, the rate of, of divergence is different, and is different in between those two um, progeny, and that's essentially what is represented here. We can say that A has essentially evolved at twice the rate as B, but B and C, you know, um, well, C has evolved very slowly relative to to, to B and A, okay? Oops, so these, in this vertically depicted tree, the ver these vertical lines here contain that um, distance information, evolutionary distance information. The horizontal lines do not contain any information, okay? It's just the vertical ones. There, okay? We can orient trees, um, well, any which way that you, that you desire. Um, normally we can have the vertical tree or horizontal trees. There's no informational difference. It's really just a, um, it's just a, a preference in the way that you wish to display the trees. So there's, there's nothing, um, nothing to be gained by inf information wise by, by depicting a tree's orientation in, in any orientation. Okay. 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 We can also, um, well, the order of the leaves also does is not informative. Um, there's there's no information about them, and because if you were to think about the vertical branches in these trees, if you were to swap them, then you can change the the order left to right that appear for the, the OTUs in the tree without changing the topology of the tree. So when we swap this one here from this ABCD, we get a DCBA arrangement that we swapped. We can swap this one here and get a BCDA. And so these all have a different leaf order, but the topology is unchanged in the trees. So, <coughs> so this is we're trying to reinforce here. If it's important for interpretation that we understand that only the topology and the distance information is is what uh, is conveys anything about the evolutionary history of those of those organisms. Okay, so trees can be rooted or unrooted. Um, and the root of the tree I mentioned earlier is the hypothetical ancestor of all of the uh, leaf nodes, all of the OTUs, all the organisms that have that, that are under study um, um, and have been built with that, are been used to build the tree. So a tree that have a root that has a root gives you an absolute order of the um, the the well the direction of the descent. Okay, so you can say if this is if you have a known root, then you can say this um, evolved this one evolved from this one, and then this one evolved from this one, and then this one evolved from this one. You've got that sort of a timeline fixed when you have a root, but um, you don't um, always have information about what the um, uh, which organism is ancestral to the, all the other organisms when you're doing a study. In those cases, the best that you can do is to build an, an unrooted tree. So unrooted trees have no root. They're, they have an evolutionary relationship to each other, but the timeline is unknown for them, okay? So when they're, so they're less informative um, they, because they don't give you the, that absolute um, direction of evolution, uh, but they still give you the relative um, evolution between the, the organisms in the tree. So when depicting um, an unrooted tree versus a rooted tree, normally they will present it in what's called a radial format here. So you can't actually determine, like it doesn't appear that there's a common ancestor to all of them. They just appear that they're related to each other. Okay, any questions about unrooted trees? All right. Again, just trying to reinforce rooted versus unrooted trees here. So this is um, 
the, the same OTUs that are being depicted in a rooted tree and in an unrooted tree. When you have a rooted tree, you know which one, which is the, the one that is most ancestral. So you have your ancestral node here. Oops, not very good at these Macs. And it, um, so modern species four diverged from its, from this common ancestor more recently than the um, ancestor of species one, two, and three, which, and the ancestor of two and three diverged um, more recently than the ancestor of one, two, and three, etc., etc. We have that absolute order of descendancy. In an unrooted tree, we don't have the root. So we know that there is an ancestor of species one and two, and we know that there's an ancestor of species three and four. So we have these ancestors here. We don't know which one of those ancestors is came first, which one is ancestral to, to the other one. That's the difference, okay? We can't really determine that absolute order of descendancy. Okay, so it's possible to root a tree if you have additional information about the organisms beyond just the, the sequence information that, you, um, that you're using to build the tree. So for example, and that, those are called an, an out group and the, um, the rest of the species are called the, the in group. So if you do, if you know that one of the, um, the if you have additional information that, that, lets, that tells you that one of the um, organisms is ancestral to the others, then you're allowed to say, okay, I'm going to, I can place my root between that ancestor or between that taxa and the, the in-group here. So cows, humans, and chimps, these are all mammals. Zebrafish is a vertebrate, but it's certainly not a mammal. It's ancestral. And so if we add the root between the zebrafish and the mammals, then we can get a, in this unrooted tree, then we can get a rooted tree here that's big, that says, okay, zebrafish diverged and then, um, you know, from its ancestor before the um, ancestor of the cow, human, and the chimp. It's maybe a little bit more complicated. Are there any questions about rooted versus unrooted trees? Normally when you build a phylogenetic tree, you, there, the, there's no information about your outgroup, but when you visualize the tree, you are allowed to choose one of the organisms that you come in and say, I know that this is the ancestral organism, and you choose it, and then the, the, the tree visualization software will rearrange the tree from an unrooted tree into a rooted tree for you. Okay. All right, so um, the number of trees that um, you can possibly build uh, is a function of the number of organisms that you're using, um, that, that you're studying with the tree. So they, and they grow geometrically. Um, this pi here is kind of like the multiplicative um, equivalent of the summation sign, which people are a little bit normally familiar with. You add a series of values together. Here you're multiplying. A series of values together, and here we're basically multi we're determining the number of trees as a function of the number of OTUs. So the smallest tree that you can build in a regular bifurcating tree um, requires three OTUs. Okay, and uh, there's only and so there's only one tree for three OTUs. If you go to four OTUs, then you can have uh, three possible trees. Uh, three different ways to, to three different topologies that can um, uh, th th that you can use to relate those different OTUs together. At five, there's 15 possible combinations, and at 10, there's two million combinations. When you get up to about 30, you start approaching like the numbers of atoms in the universe kind of thing. It really, really grows very, very quickly, and so this becomes a bit of a this combinatorial complexity becomes a bit of a, of a becomes a major issue actually when working with, um, uh, with, with trees and trying to figure out how to build the best tree. But let's see how that's done. So when we're working with the sequence data that we've collected from a group of taxa, a group of OTUs, the way that we can use, um, use that data to build an, an, uh, an, a phylogenetic tree is with a, a multiple sequence alignment here. So here is our the, our organisms are taxa A, B, C, and D, 
and here's their sequences. We place the sequences together in a, in a multiple aligned block, um, and that is the data that we're going to use to infer the tree. We also need to use a model of evolution, which I'll talk about briefly later. Some people say I don't talk about it briefly enough, but um, we'll talk about it later. And this is sometimes assumed, and I'll show you what I mean by that. And then some algorithm that's used to build that tree up. Okay, and there's three um, main tree building methods. There's the distance-based, there's character-based, and there's Bayesian. Okay, there are some additional uh, kind of esoteric ways to build trees that don't fall into these three main um, tree building methods. And I'm only going to talk about the distance-based methods and the character-based methods. Oops, the, um, the, the Bayesian methods, which is more recently developed method in the last 20 years, um, it is more powerful um, and provides a good statistical framework for um, interpreting the tree. But it is complicated, and I tried to give an introduction to it last year in the class mutinied. But I still have those lecture notes. So if anybody is interested in learning about how Bayesian trees work, um, I and we might be able to say find some time outside of the class over the next two days, um, maybe I can put up a little sign-up sheet or something if people are interested in learning a little bit about how Bayesian trees work, because it is actually a very powerful method and it can do a lot of cool stuff that the other the character based methods and the uh, the distance based methods can't so, so it's it's actually worth knowing about but it's complicated so I'm gonna leave it out anyways let's start with the distance based methods so in the in the distance based methods what we're um, what we're simply trying to do is to count the number of differences in our multiple alignment and then use those those distances as the the metric for the evolutionary distance between the different organisms and that's the information that we use to build our tree okay so we take the multiple alignment and then we use it to build something called a distance matrix and um, the distance matrix is then used to build our uh, our phylogenetic trees of which there are two main distance-based methods. There's one called UPGMA and one called neighbor joining. So let's just take a quick look here. We have sequences A and B, and we have a distance matrix here where we just list um, on the columns and the rows um, all of our different taxa, A, B, C, and D, and A, B, C, and D here. And then we count the numbers of differences between them. So for A and A, of course, it's always going to be zero because it's exactly the same, but let's just take a look at A and B. So in this column here, we can see that there's one difference. There's a T and an A. Here's another difference, T and an A. Here's a third difference, an A and a T. That's the same, that's the same, that's the same, that's the same. Three differences. Right? So we plop three into there. And you can do that for every cell in your matrix, and you will tabulate all of the differences between, uh, it's sort of an all against all difference um, table for that multiple sequence alignment. And if you like, you, you know, later on, you might want to just go confirm that, these, that this is the actual distance matrix that's been built from this tree, or from this multiple sequence alignment. Okay. So this is a, looks a little bit more complicated here, but essentially what I'm saying is that when we want to build a tree, we, the input from the tree for the tree building algorithm is, for a distance-based method is, the, is that difference matrix, which we call M, right? And the idea here is to try and build a tree where each leaf in the tree corresponds to a sequence in the in your distance matrix. So we've got A through E here, and we've got our tree A through E here. And the if you add up the distances for in um, bet between all of the different OTUs in the tree, then you will um, uh, they will match the the distance matrix. Okay. So for example. We have a distance here from A to B of 7 plus 5, that's 12. So A, B, 12 here, right? Well, it turns out that if you have the tree and you with the known distances, it is trivial to build up that distance matrix. You just, just add the numbers up and put them into the matrix, okay? 
If you have a matrix and you want to build the tree where those distances map exactly back to the distances in the tree, not easy. It turns out there may not even exist a tree where you can exactly recreate the distance matrix. What you can do is try and get as close as you can, but you cannot, you, it may be the case that you can't actually build a tree um, from a distance matrix where all of those distance constraints are exactly satisfied. Are there any questions about that? No? Okay. All right. So, so instead of trying to fit the tree exactly to the data, to the multiple sequence alignment, the process of tree building is one where we want to minimize the, the, the differences in the distances in that are in that tree and the distances that are in our distance matrix. Okay, we're trying to minimize those, those differences. We're trying to get them all down to zero if we can, but maybe we can't, so there might be a discrepancy of, of one or two or something like that. What we're trying, essentially, the process is to, um, well, to develop a tree that satisfies what's called the cavalli sforza criterion, which was where we, essentially what this says, minimize the sum of the differences between the distances in your tree and the distances in your distance matrix. Okay? Well, is that, does that make sense? The reason that you square it is so that you get rid of that whole negative positive problem where some, some distances may be un, less than zero and some above zero. So it's really just sort of just taking those dis, the, the sum of all of the distances that, that are discrepancies between your tree and the, and, the, and the matrix and minimize. The problem here is that getting the best fit tree is what's called an NP-complete problem. So does anybody know what NP-complete means? You know, okay, well, you don't. Uh, okay, do you want to give us an answer of what NP-complete means? In simple terms, there is no simple, you know, exact solution and can be solved in a reasonable amount of time. That's right. It means that there is no, uh, well, there, there's the only way to determine for sure that you actually have the right answer is to look at all possible variations. It's essentially to brute force your way through. So you'd have to take a look at all the possible distances that you um, with that are within the scope of that um, uh, of the distance matrix in the tree, and then uh, uh, of the distance matrix. You have to take those all, um, evaluate all the different values, and then find the tree with the distance values that are that that satisfy the cavalli for as a criterion that minimize that 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 that, uh, that distance that might be okay if you have say four taxa or five taxa but if you start getting up to the 10 or the 15 or the 25 then the number of computations then that, that, that you'd have to brute force just becomes what's called intractable okay it is not it can't be solved in what's called polynomial time so so we need to use these heuristic methods that don't guarantee us that we're going to get the correct tree, but they narrow down the you know uh, towards what is what is likely uh, the correct tree or is close to the correct tree. So the UPGMA method, which stands for unweighted pair group method with arithmetic mean, is one of the simplest methods that can be used to build a tree and so it doesn't it doesn't require that you evaluate all the possible trees it's going to just use a method that's going to create one tree for you it just starts with the the data set the, the distance matrix and it ends up with the with a tree at the end the way that it works is kind of like this it looks around and says which two are which two of the OTUs have the smallest distance between them. So it looks like maybe three and five here have the smallest distance between them. And I'll say, okay, I'm going to connect those two together. Okay, and then so they get a common ancestor. Then you do another um, uh, calculation to see what is the next closest to and it, and so it and in this case we look here and we say okay well one and two are closest together um, after connecting three and five so we'll connect those together then you look again and say which are the next set that are the closest together well it turns out that the that the ancestor of three and five and four are the closest together so you will connect those together 
So you can see what we're doing here is we're connecting 3 and 5 here, then we connect 1 and 2 here, then we connect 3, 5, and 4 here, like what's going on here, and then, well, there's nothing really left to connect except for 1 and 2, so that's the last step. Okay, and that's built when we build our tree that way. That's the UPGMA method. Very, very simple method, very quick method. Okay, so, <clears throat> so it's very quick, um, but it has some limitations. So for example, it infers one ancestral sequence per step. It basically says, you know, I'm going to connect these two together, and that's my one ancestral step, and there's not, and it connects them together in the middle, so there's no relative divergence between the two that you connected, and there's, and that same process is applied over and over again as you build up the tree. So you can see here, there's essentially, this is one step here, this is another step here, this is another step here, and then the final step that, or, that organizes them there, there. So the evolutionary distance between the hypothetical ancestor and all the taxa are all the same. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Four, okay? The evolutionary the distances are all exactly the same. It's called, it's called an ultra, ultra metric tree. And that is a very poor assumption about how real um, organisms evolve, right? Because they do acquire these different rates of divergence after they speciate from each other. Um, and so it's, it's a very it's a very quick way to get uh, to get the topology of the tree, um, but the the distance information here is likely not correct. So neighbor joining is. Is there any questions about EPGMA trees? No. Okay. So neighbor joining is a second popular distance-based clustering algorithm for inferring phylogenetic trees um, that uh, can incorporate the relative distance information in the way that the UPGMA does and so that you can actually get different branch lengths um, between the uh, between the, the, the different taxa and for their, their different ancestors. So the way that it the way that it works is using something called um, star decomposition. So, so here where we, uh, the big difference is that the UPGMA just looks at the, the, the closest neighbors, but the, the neighbor joining tree takes into account the distance from each node to all of the other nodes in the tree, okay? Like this. So you start out with your distance matrix here, and you calculate a new matrix called a Q matrix, and that Q matrix there is um, the one that is essentially saying what is the, how close are these two nodes to each other, and how far away are they on average from all of the other nodes. Okay, so we're getting this information not just about the two that were that are under consideration, but the distance, the relative distance between the two and the rest of the nodes, essentially kind of like how close are they to the center here in this completely unresolved star topology tree, which is the one that I talked about briefly, introduced briefly when we're talking about polytomies. This is the, the completely unresolved tree. So the Q matrix here is essentially what it's allowing us to do is to create um, a new node that um, well, that takes into account the distance between um, the, the, the two individuals that you're grouping together and their distance to the, to, to the rest of the, the tax in the tree, like this. So instead of connecting them right in the middle, like a UPGMA tree does, it will apply a kind of a weighted proportion and say, well, A is closer to the rest than B was, so I'm going to connect the node closer to A than I will to B here. So you can have, say, a distance of 1 here and a distance of 4 here. So now we have that differential length information that's incorporated in there, and you now repeat this in the same way that you do with the UPGMA trees. Uh, you calculate a new Q matrix where you have the, the new value is the node for, the, for A and B and the rest um, of the members, and then you find the next closest node that also um, that is distant from most distant from the center, and you just regenerate a new internal node. And at the end you'll have your fully resolved 
tree that has the um, a better representation of the actual divergence between the um, the members of the of the tree um, from the other members of the tree. So the relative distance information is captured in there. So normally you will build an unrooted tree. Um, remember the tree after you build the unrooted tree. The, so the UPGMA tree infers a root because it's actually going from the from the two most closest to the two least closest, and so it's actually going towards a hypothetical common ancestor that is the root, but it may very well not be the root. This one will build an unrooted tree, and that's where you can apply your, if you have information about which one is um, ancestral, say A is ancestral to the other, you can say, okay, I'm going to put my root right there, and now you will have that absolute ancestry. Questions about neighbor joining trees? Okay. So just summarizing of the distance methods so that they, uh, they are heuristic methods, rules of thumb type methods that allow you to get around the process of having to calculate every possible tree. Um, and so you don't have to brute force your way through and, and it reduces the problem from being intractable to tractable. The neighbor joining tree is preferred over UPGMA because it's not ultrametric. It is it allows for the relative rates of divergence to be incorporated into the tree. And um, but the distance methods throw some of the information away, <coughs> specifically information that is contained with the within the actual character data, the actual multiple alignment itself. Like when you see an A switch to a G, that's you know just counts as a distance or, or, or a change of one. But a change from an A to a G may be different from a change to from an A to a C at the molecular level. There are different um, forces that are that are acting on the uh, you know um, on the well on that the DNA sequence that result basically in the you know in in its divergence and different characters basically their 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 mapping from one or their their mutation from one to the other can can be other have different pressures so they can be um, acquired more easily or some are acquired more difficultly and, and less easily for example so all that information is being thrown away so the character methods they work in with the same process of like uh, that you use with um, the distance based methods so you start with a multiple alignment uh, but you end up with uh, well you in, you you include the character information when you're gonna when you build those trees so these character methods which are called discrete methods they don't just work on the on the uh, the distance of information, you don't calculate a distance matrix. You work directly on that multiple sequence alignment, and you're taking into account the actual mutations, uh, um, and uh, you can apply different numerical values basically to the rates of mutation from one uh, nucleotide to another. Okay, and there's two main types of character-based methods. There's the maximum um, parsimony method and maximum likelihood. Maximum parsimony is easier to explain, um, but it is not really that well used. Most people, when they're going to use a, uh, the character-based methods, will use maximum likelihood. So I'm not going to describe maximum parsimony. I'm going to describe maximum likelihood for you. But it, but the maximum parsimony, um, the the algorithm itself is trying to find the the tree that describes the sequence with the fewest evolutionary steps. So those ancestors have these. Uh, are going to have the uh, you can reconstruct basically what the sequences were that gave rise to the ancestors for the internal nodes and you choose the tree that has the least number of mutations that are required to get from any one um, taxon to the uh, one taxa to the other taxa okay that's a little bit complicated um, it will become a little bit clear here as I go through maximum likelihood so maximum likelihood it's a more sophisticated approach than maximum parsimony, but in, and it essentially involves involves finding the tree that is that is that has that best describes the data, which is the multiple sequence alignment. Okay. All right, and it is a probabilistic model, and so in and in order to do that, it has to have. Um, well, a probabilistic framework, and and uh, and the probabilistic framework is incorporated through the use of these what are called substitution models or evolutionary models. Okay, so 
So the maximum likely tree is trying to find the tree that maximizes the probability of observing the data. So we're trying to formulate this and describe this here in, a, in more of a, an, a, a probabilistic terms. Don't panic. This is mostly a probability free talk. Okay. So you have your model of sequence evolution, which is a probabilistic model, and you have your observed data. That's your multiple sequence alignment and you're trying to find the tree that best describes, that best fits that data given that evolutionary model. And the way that that's depicted in, a, uh, in, in, a, in probability notation is where that we're saying, um, what, are, you know, wh uh, what is the probability of seeing that data given that tree and that model of evolution? And we're trying to maximize that, maximize the probability that the, that, that tree uh, with that model, tree T and model M, um, uh, was derived from that data set. Okay, so let's take a look at a simple evolutionary model. So there's this, this one's tr um, uh, the transitions versus transversions model. So transitions are the mutation or interchange of two purines or two pyrimidines. And so the, the purines are the um, those are the nucleotides that contain two rings here, here, and the pyrimidines are the one that contain just the one ring here. So the transitions are an interchange here between the two rings, the purines, or the, or the one ring nucleotides, the pyrimidines. And then the transversions are all of the other possible um, mutations, right? So anything that involves a, 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 a mutation of a one ring nucleotide to a two ring nucleotide or the other way around is called a transversion. So um, just using standard um, combinatorial mathematics, you would think that the, you can, because you can have one, two, three, four possible transversions from the A, G, C's, and C's, and only two possible transitions that you'd get about twice as many transversions as you would get transitions. But it turns out that that's not the case. Actually, the transitions occur at a higher frequency than the transversions do. And can anybody suggest why? They, they tolerate each other for the, for the swap better, right? Yeah, they look more like each other. So they can be, they can be, they're better tolerated um, when there's a mutation. They're not recognized and excised during, during, in a proofreading as often as the transversions are. Also, <coughs> transitions um, are, they're, they're less likely to result in amino acid, um, amino acid substitutions and the, so we know that there's 64 different codons that um, code for 20 different amino acids, and so there's uh, degeneracy in the codons that can that can code for an, um, an amino acid. For example, there's six different codons that can code for leucine. Okay, and the um, the the differences between those codons are um, overwhelmingly transition type. Um, uh, mutations versus transversion type mutations, and they also occur in what's called the wobble base. Um, so because the, the amino acid that is encoded from a transition is normally this, well, is more often the same than it is from a transversion, that means that the function of the, um, of the protein that's generated from that codon is the same, and so it's more well tolerated than it would be um, if it uh, was a non-synonymous mutation or one that resulted in amino acid change. All right, so that's transitions and transversions. And so now we know that basically an A to a T, where if it was a character, I mean, a distance-based method, we would just count that as one. But an A and a, to a T may be different than, say, an A to a G, right, because of this whole um, because of the evolutionary pressures of transitions versus transversions. So we can take that information into account in a maximum likelihood approach. That is our model of evolution, our substitution model. So in a maximum likelihood tree, we're going to go column by column through our multiple sequence alignment 
and we're going to try and find the best tree that explains that um, the, 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 the mutations that we see here. So what we're asking is, what is the, probabil the probability of this of data one, which is base, or column one, right? Given this tree here, now how many trees can we have if we have four taxa? Anybody remember? The smallest is is three taxa, gives one tree. Then the second smallest is four taxa, which gives three three trees. And uh, so there's three possible trees. But we're going to just try this one tree here at the start. We want to see does this how what is the probability that this tree explains this um, well this these observed mutations in this one column of the of our multiple sequence alignment, knowing that transitions have a probability of say 0.3, transversions have a probability of 0.1, and then nothing like where there's no mutation has a probability of 0.6. Okay, those are the values that we use to to apply the weights to transitions versus transversions. Okay, so the way to do this is to reconstruct the ancestral state. So the internal nodes here, we want to say, okay, you know, what is the possible, you know, how did, what, if this were, say, a G, then you'd have a G to A transition here and a G to A transition here. Let's say this was a G here, you'd have no, um, uh, no mutation here, and then you'd have a G to G and a G to G here, right? That's, you're reconstructing one ancestral state. We have to reconstruct all the different ancestral states, and there's four different nucleotides, and there's two positions, so it's four squared, or 16 different combinations that we're going to have to um, evaluate and take a look at what the probabilities were that that, that that tree with that ancestral state explains that data set. So, the, so this is what we do. So here like, we place a G and a C, for example, that's our starting one. We're going to have to do 15, uh, an, an, another 15 of them. But then we can go using our model of transitions versus transversions. We can basically plug in and say, okay, what's the probability of seeing a G to A here and a G to A here and a G to C here and a C to G here and a C to G there. And that's what all this is here. And we, so we multiply those together and then that gives us this one probability that this tree with this ancestral state gave rise to this column of mutations. Any questions about that? Go ahead. Okay, uh, don't ask that question. <laughs> we don't deal with them. Okay, so there's two ways to deal with deletions and, and insertions. Um, there's what's called the double deletion model and there's the full deletion model. A double deletion model says, it says if you see two deletions in uh, one column, then you can consider that to be like a fifth character and you can include that as actual information uh, as long as you basically have an evolutionary model that can explain the, the you know, those, those <coughs> gaps. The problem is that's missing information, right? You, so it's hard to apply a value to that and so it's not normally used in maximum likelihood. It's normally used more just in character based or distance based methods where you can say that's a change I can add one to my distance matrix, right? Normally don't do it for maximum likelihood trees. The other one is called the full deletion model, which is do not consider any deletions. Any gaps are just excluded. And that's what we use here in maximum likelihood. And that by uh, far and away is the uh, approach that uh, is used to generate basically all, um, nearly all uh, phylogenetic trees. Okay, good question. Okay, so but getting back to here, so just um, just to just reviewing quickly, what we've done is we've done, we've created one ancestral straight on one tree, and we've evaluated the probability in one column. Okay, there. So now we have to do it again with a different ancestral state, um, and that would be our second case, right? And then our third case, and then we get all sixteen different ancestral states, and then we add those up together, and that is the probability that that tree with that mutation model gave rise to the um, mutations that we saw in that one column. <coughs> then we have to do it for all the other trees, right? And here there's three trees, so we're going to have to do another 16 on a second tree and another 16 on a third tree. And then that will give us the overall 
um, uh, the, the, the maximum likelihood, uh, we can choose the maximum likelihood by giving us the, the, by choosing the tree that has the, well, the, the highest chance of explaining that one column. That's maximum likelihood. Then we have to do it for all the columns. So, uh, so what, which method would you guys think is, would be the, the, the least computationally expensive method? UPGMA, neighbor joining, or maximum likelihood? UPGMA, right. The second easiest would be neighbor joining. Yeah, right. And then the one that involves the most computational expense is maximum likelihood. It absolutely is. There are ways of, there are tricks that can be used in these um, more complicated tree building methods that allow you to say, look, if this, I can tell looking at this, for looking at this subset of, of trees, um, that I will never get a maximum likelihood that's better than I have now, right, for this one case. It's, um, and so it's a basically a tree pruning method that I say, I don't have to evaluate that subset, right? I, there's a way that you can kind of tell that you won't um, improve your, your likelihood. So you don't have to evaluate every possible tree, but you still have to do an enormous amount of computation in order to build a maximum likelihood tree. So it's more computationally expensive. Um, but the evolution model means and it can incorporate the it can incorporate a lot of different information um, that and uh, you can swap out the rates of mutation for the uh, for the well for the for molecular clock data, which can actually give you a timeline of evolution. So rather than having a uh, you know, those values that you normally place on a phylogram that will show you the, those distances. Those distances are normally substitutions, right? But you can, with these maximum likelihood methods, you can start to swap those out for actual time um, to, like, from the, uh, for example, you can predict the uh, time to the emergence of the of a common ancestor, what time did this ancestor occur, and then and gave rise to the progeny? So it's it's, it's, a, it's a lot more. There's a lot more information that can that can be built or that can be um, interpreted from the maximum likelihood approaches. Okay, so which is the best tree? I think we kind of answered that question already. It really depends on the circumstances. If you have an enormous number of taxa in your tree, hundreds or thousands, then the maximum likelihood approach might not be the best approach. Although there are algorithms for building maximum likelihood trees that work on um, in high performance computing environments like RaxML. So it can distribute the processing amongst thousands of processors. That's what we do over at the NML. Um, <clears throat> there are other methods like fast tree, which kind of is, well, it has, has less guarantee of giving you the best tree, but it is a maximum likelihood approach that, well, makes a whole bunch of additional kind of maybe not correct assumptions, but will can more quickly generate a tree for you, and it still is based on a maximum likelihood approach. But essentially, if you um, the best tree building method really just depends on the number of taxa. If you have access to that character information, which you may or may not have, and we're going to see that um, in the um, in the next module, uh, where we're going using gene by gene based approaches, that the actual character information is is not really available to you. So that's when you're going to want to use the distance based methods. But if you have the if you have the computational horsepower. And you have the character data available to you, then um, the probably the the maximum likelihood approach is going to give you the most accurate tree. Then there's Bayesian, but we're not talking about that. Okay. Any questions up to this point? How am I doing for time? What time is it? It's twelve. So I've been going for an hour. Well, I'm getting much closer to the end. Okay, so bear with me. I think if you'll be able to get through it, it'll be about another 10 minutes. Okay, so each of these approaches is going to build a tree for us. But there's still a question about how correct is that tree, right? We just, we don't know if you've, that the, 
that there may not be a lot of really strong phylogenetic information contained in the multiple sequence alignment in the first place. And so there, you're always going to get a tree with these methods, but whether you're going to get a tree that's actually representative of the evolutionary history of those organisms is, at that point, still unknown. So bootstrapping is a semi-statistically defensible way of um, of inferring the robustness of that tree and whether it is actually giving you a correct tree. And it can be used on all of the different methods um, that involved a, a multiple sequence alignment. Well, uh, that involved all oh, distance based methods can, can work as well. And the idea here is that you're going to generate a whole bunch of trees, but you're going to do it by shuffling that multiple sequence alignment around a bit and generate trees from these shuffled alignments and then see if you get the same tree or if you get a very different tree. And if you get like lots of trees that are really the same, then that means that the phylogenetic information is so strong in that shuffled multiple sequence alignment that it doesn't really matter. Um, uh, if, but if you get a whole bunch of different trees as a result of the shuffling event, then that tells you that the information is really weak and there's a lot of confounding factors in there that are giving you um, different um, trees at the end. So. The method is essentially to just build a whole bunch, to, to, to shuffle your multiple sequence alignment and then rebuild the tree and then start to map the numbers of, uh, well, of nodes in the tree that contain the same, um, well, that have identical clades or that contain the same taxa within a certain internal node. I'll show you what I mean here. Okay, so here's kind of the idea. The shuffling is, is called um, sampling with replacement. And the idea here is that we're going to choose columns from the original multiple sequence alignment and we're going to build a new multiple sequence alignment, but we're not going to choose every column. And some columns we might choose more than once. It's a random sampling with replacement type of procedure. Okay, so imagine that you have an eight-sided die and you're going to roll that die and, and the outcome on the die is going to tell you which column to choose. And then you're going to use that to create a new alignment until you have a new multiple sequence alignment that's the same size as the original. So in this example here, you might have chosen 6, 1, 6, 8 or something like that. So we have 6 chosen twice and maybe 2 doesn't get represented, but we're starting to build up our resampled alignment. So some of those columns are going to contain that hopefully that strong information and some are going to contain, going to, some are going to be swapped out and maybe they contain some strong information or maybe they don't. Maybe it's all kind of the same amount of, of strong information, in which case it doesn't really matter. This is what the bootstrapping is going to tell us. You get that new resampled alignment, oops, and then you do that a hundred times and then you kind of like glom all those trees on top of each other and then you look to see which of the um, ancestors contain the same um, uh, taxa underneath it across all the trees. So for example here we can see that red here has A and B under it in two trees and green here has C, B and A under it in three trees. Oops. And purple has the A, B and C and D under it in two of the trees. So we can place, so we say okay three and two and two and we can place those basically at those nodes here and that is our bootstrapped tree. So if you've done say 100 trees and your <laughs> nodes have values that range from say 100 which means it, it captured the same sub uh, subclade every time at that node uh, then that value is going to get 100. Others may have gotten like 70 out of 100 trees would have been the same so that that at that node, so it gets a 70, that's, uh, that's your bootstrap value. And so essentially it's telling you how robust are the trees that you're building from that data set, how strong is the phylogenetic information in that data set. And, um, and that's kind of a, yeah, that's a metric of your, of the robustness of the tree. And so normally people will choose a value of say maybe 70 or 75 um, uh, percent right, 75 of, of, yeah, 75 percent or higher is considered to be a robust node within the tree and that it can be interpreted as correct. Okay, any questions about bootstrapping? Okay, all right, so very quickly, so we, we looked at transversion, transitions and transversions as an, as an evolutionary model. 
And the, the idea here is that we want to have a, you know, more accurately represent the rates of diversion um, uh, that are uh, inherent in the, uh, the evolutionary relationship of the organisms that we're studying. And the evolutionary models help to provide that information for us. So one really simple model is called the p distance. And all you do here is you calculate the fractional difference in, in your multiple sequence alignment. You just take a look at the number of columns that have differences versus the columns that do not. And you create a ratio, and then that's your, your distance here. So if you have a alignment of, say, two sequences that have L positions, the number of uh, positions where they differ is, is D, then you have D over L, and that's P. That's your evolutionary distance. Substitutions per site is, is, is essentially what that is. But it's not really a very serious measure um, for a lot of reasons. <coughs> for example, um, the the different, the different columns, those different sites that we're looking at can have different rates of divergence. So think about a protein sequence. You may have a, say you have a protein sequence that is on the surface of a virus or a bacterium, and it may have sections that are highly conserved. Say maybe the membrane spanning region is really highly conserved, and it may have a, um, a receptor site on it or something that can't really change because of the, it will abolish its function if it does. But it may have other epitope regions that are the parts that are getting attacked by the immune system, and those are under um, positive selection. And so those are going to mutate much more rapidly than the conserve functionally important and conserved parts. So there's different rates of divergence, um, even within the same protein sequence. That is much more common. The P distance does not take any of that into account. There's something called a gamma distance correction that does take that into account. Essentially what it's doing is trying to capture the scope of the, of the um, rates of divergence within the um, multiple sequence alignment that you're looking at here. And so this is the equation for it. It uses this, this parameter alpha, which kind of changes the shape of that distribution. You kind of have to know what that alpha is, but for protein sequences it typically ranges between about 0.2 and about 3.5. So you can, if you, if you have an idea of what that rate is, then you can apply something called a gamma, um, a gamma um, correction to it or gamma distance correction to it. So then that's called tau. So sometimes you'll see when people are reporting the evolutionary models that they'll say, I'm using a Jukes Cantor plus tau on it, right? And that, or plus, excuse me, plus gamma, not tau, plus gamma. And that's what this is referring to, is that they're trying to, encap you know, trying to capture those different rates of, of divergence. Then there's these um, other substitution models. So the transversions and versus transitions is one type of substitution model, and there are a number of different types of substitution models that essentially are trying to capture what are these relative rates of substitution from one nucleotide for another nucleotide in an all against all kind of um, table. So they're the more sophisticated ones, and they um, there's a, a couple that are more popular, like the Jukes Cantor. Um, this is the, the K80 and the HKY85. Listed them here for you as well. And without getting into too much um, detail about it, what they're trying to do essentially is to is to explain for you. Well, the, these are the assumptions that are being used to to calculate those um, those different uh, uh, probabilities of of mutation from one nucleotide to another. Okay, there. So there's a bunch of them. Actually, there's over 20. So how do you choose the best model? Well, that's kind of difficult to know what is the best model to choose. So one way to choose the best model is to build a couple of trees with different models and then see how well do they explain the data set. Now, what's the most likely evolutionary model? to explain that data set, kind of like the we use maximum likelihood to find out what's the best tree and model to explain a data set. Here we basically are just saying, let's just take a tree, try a bunch of different models, and see which one gives us the best, best explains that data set, gives us that maximum likelihood. So it's called a maximum likelihood ratio test, and there's a um, program called JModelTest that you can download that will 
run through a bunch of different evolutionary models, compare them all to each other, and give you the best evolutionary model for that data set. Okay, okay. So we're just about done. Um, I want to talk now about whole genome phylogenies, and they are not conceptually any different than the regular phylogenies, which normally just use a single gene. Okay, they, it's just that we are now extending out the amount of phylogenetic information um, out to an entire genome. And so these um, are more recently developed approaches since the um, so sort of the, the, the widespread introduction of whole genome sequencing has allowed us to be able to generate data sets of that scale and to be able to, to use them. And um, they are the main method now used for, um, for doing things like foodborne disease surveillance of, of uh, well, of bacterial foodborne diseases, um, essentially other, you know, public health priority pathogens. If you can acquire a whole genome sequence for them, then you're going to do a whole genome sequence-based phylogeny. So there's there's two main methods. One is distance and one is character. Okay, and I'm not going to talk about the distance-based methods that they're going to, we're going to talk about those a little bit in module three. I'm going to talk about the character-based methods. But I just did want to show you that um, here's an example where we they have 91 um, genome sequences that have been built from a single gene, the 16S ribosomal RNA gene to build a phylogeny, and then the second phylogeny that's built, well, using distance information essentially just by blasting the genes together and looking at the amount of similarity between them to create their, their distance ma um, matrix, um, but the, um, the takeaway message here is that the, the tree on the bottom, which is built with whole genome sequence information, is much better resolved than the tree up here. And what do I mean by resolved? It's that whole polytony issue, right? If you don't have enough phylogenetic information to discriminate the different ancestors and you kind of have to group them together into a soft polytony, soft polytomies here are represented by these triangles here. Okay, and you can see lots of triangles here that basically say, oh, there's a bunch of organisms here that are all coming off of this one node, can't resolve the one from the other, so there's a lot of them. So they generally have the same kind of gross topology, but here you can see there's much less, poly there's some polytomies up here, but and one over here, but generally you're getting like that individual resolution, so it's much, much, much more um, powerful and more accurate. So. So, okay, here I have most popular approaches based on reference mapping. That's no longer true, okay? So I'll have to update those slides. But one popular approach is based upon reference mapping to extract those, um, the, well, what, the single nucleotide variants from, the, from each genome, which you then tabulate into alignment, and then you use that to build your phylogenetic tree, okay? And so this is uh, a suitable approach for for genomes that are highly similar because we're going to have to map them to a reference genome and in order to get the, the reference mapping approach assumes that the genomes that you're mapping to the reference are, are highly similar. This is kind of what reference mapping looks like. You, the, at the top we have this black line and that represents a reference genome, something that we have say extracted out of the public archive as a full, closed, finished, high quality genome from say salmonella. And the blue arrows here, those are the reads from a newly sequenced salmonella genome. Um, that, and what we're going to do here is we're going to align every read to the reference genome and find out its, you know, its optimal position here. So, so this one, you know, maps to this position, it maps to this position. At the end, after you've mapped all the reads together, you'll end up with a pileup. <coughs> then you can scan through the pileup, um, column by column, and then you look for the, for the, um, for the reads that have a nucleotide that differs from the reference sequence. That is your single nucleotide variant or single nucleotide polymorphism. So you can extract that out. So it's basically a mapping and then a, um, a detection of, of variants from there. Here's kind of the idea here. So for, 
we have a population of genomes that, um, that we've sequenced, and so we're going to have using the same common reference, we're going to take the reads from genome one, we map them to the reference, we scan along, and then we're going to pull out the variants, but we can't just pull out any variant. You want to pull out the ones that are high quality. So a low quality variant might be one where there's not much coverage, like there's not many reads that are covering that one position. Um, there's other things, and we're going to talk about those a little bit more in the uh, in the lab section. But essentially, what you do is you grab the ones that are um, high quality. There's enough coverage, and, and they they pass another uh, a set of criteria, and then you can collect those there. So that's our first um, line here. Then you repeat, just wash, rinse, repeat with every set of reads from every newly sequenced genome against that original reference sequence, and now we find another set of, of SNPs. Some are going to be the same. Um, they're going to be identical to each other in the newly sequenced one, but they'll be different from the reference sequence. Some will be the same for, as the reference, but different from, the, from each other. This is uh, essentially what you're going to get. And when you're, when you've, when you're finished the, the mapping all of the reads from all of your genome sequences against that reference, you're going to get this collection of either wild types or these single nucleotide variants in a bunch of these columns. You have to throw out all the ones where there may have not been, like if you have a, a, a gap, right, because there's no sequence information or maybe it's missing in that one genome versus the, or the, the reference genome, only the ones that are um, that contain either a wild type or a variant and is, you know, within the, uh, and is present within the entire collection are the ones that can be kept. That's called a core genome SNV, um, well, uh, phylogenomic analysis. There. So once you have them all, you can collect them together and create what's called a a SNV alignment. So this is just like our regular multiple alignment, except for we've excluded all of the identical um, information because that's too much information to build a phylogenetic tree in. Although some programs can can try and can handle it, um, but essentially you're going to get this sort of compacted one where every column is going to contain um, some type of variant in it. That's your SNV alignment, and then just. You can either use a distance phase approach, or you can use your maximum likelihood, or anything that's available to you that takes a multiple sequence alignment, and you use it to build your tree. That's it um, for building for building SNV-based um, phylogenomic trees. So the so the just to summarize, it uses just reads. You don't have to use assemblies, which is computationally expensive and introduces problems. But you can you can get some what we call bad SNPs, not high quality SNPs, and ones that actually aren't containing the, you know, good phylogenetic information. So paralogs, copies that, um, that can occur in multiple places can, you know, internal repeats can cause problems. So you want to have to, you want to get rid of those. You can get what are called homoplastic SNPs, which are ones that are not actually, um, well, they're not consistent with the true evolutionary history of those organisms, and those can occur from things like recombination or from horizontal gene transfer. And these last couple, there's just three more slides here, um, which are not in your print, in your handout, so I'm, I, uh, forgive me for that, I sent the wrong ones in for, for printing, um, but there's just, there's just three, three slides here, and of course you guys have the, the electronic copy. So recombination is essentially, well, it's this process of breaking um, one chromosomal segment and then, or genomic segment, and then incorporating a new segment in its place. So there's kind of two main types. One's called homologous recombination, where if you have two really highly similar strands, say one from an, um, from the that's harbored from the organism, and another one that the organism say uptook from the environment, which they do. Then if they're highly similar, then they can swap out, or they can replace the one chunk. Um, in the from the from the one um, genome into the other genome, so that's homologous. And then there's um, non-homologous recombination, but it, so those are kind of special cases that we're not really going to talk about. And don't worry about all the complications here in the diagram. Essentially, the, the, just the idea is starting with you know your black and red genomes, you end up basically with combinations of black and red genomes at the end, right? So they're but they're highly similar, and the way that they manifest themselves is because you 
they will have a different evolutionary origin when they're popped into that genome, that they will, when you map them against a reference sequence, they would show up with an abnormally high localized density of variants relative to the rest of the collection. Okay, so there's a, a way to, to find them. Doing it in a kind of statistically rigorous way is very, very computationally expensive. And so, the, um, but there are some kind of cheaper methods by essentially just looking to see how what is the the rate of the occurrence of those variants in your collection of genomes against that reference sequence that allow you to identify possible recombination. And then finally, here just so wanted to talk a little bit about genomic islands. So these so genomic islands are essentially these these clusters of genes and genomes that have some possible um, well, they have evidence of a possible um, lateral gene transfer or horizontal origin. So recombination is one of them, but with genomic islands, it's more like a big chunk came from some external um, environment and was incorporated into the genome, just like as an additional um, insertion. Okay, and there's a bunch of different types like integrons and phage and uh, uh, the integrative conjugative elements, etc. I'm not going to go into any of the detail about this, but um, they are important because that is a source of, of confounding evolutionary information. So when you're trying to build your phylogenetic tree, what you typically want to get is that you want to capture the clonality the of the of the of, well the evolutionary um, relationship of the of the clonal expansion, right? Not basically this lateral gene transfer that's coming in from random places. So identifying this can be, or if, if you include this in your trees, they can confound the trees and make it so you get an incorrect tree. The uh, so the primary resource for the detection of genomic islands is called Island Viewer. Actually, it's developed um, by Professor in Professor Brinkman's lab here, and um, it's. Uh, it can take your, your genome sequence data, you upload your data, and it will go and find those regions of possible horizontal origin. And um, even though it's not um, a straightforward event, hopefully it will be soon, but um, these days what you can do within that site is you can download those regions and then you can put them into a, a, a phylogenomic tree building um, tool, like the Sniffle tool, that we're going to look at after lunch and say, mask that region out. And that's one of the things that you guys should keep in your mind when you go through the lab, um, that the, the, because of the issues of things like recombination and horizontal gene transfer can confound a phylogeny at an entire genome scale versus at, a gene scale, at the gene scale, then um, you are, uh, those types of phylogenies are vulnerable to have this, this confounding phylogenetic information that you don't want in there. So a good phylogenomic tree building program will have some functionality to allow you to say do not um, like block mask out this region and you know and do not incorporate you know don't do not include these regions for consideration in the final um, phylogeny. Okay? Okay. So